Man, it is so good to be back with you and to see you guys again. If you're new with us, I want to welcome you here. So thankful uh, that you've joined us. Some of you have joined us over the last six weeks. And, you know, I mean, you thought, you know, Caleb was the pastor here. He very well could have been the way that he's uh, led and, uh, and has stepped up in such an incredible way. Man, thank you. That wasn't supposed to be the spot. I have, I have. Uh, that's coming. But, um, but man, I'm just so thankful to be here. If, again, if you're a guest, let us know that you're here. There's a blue card around you in a basket somewhere. Uh, it's called a Connect card, and and we don't want to harass you this week. We just want to be able to follow up with you, and uh, and and just be able to thank the Lord for you and help this place become a home. Uh, and um, and I'd love to be able to just touch base with you um, sometime this week. Okay. So if you grab that, fill that out, put it in the basket on the way out, or you can bring it to me directly. Um, on your way out the doors, and uh, I'll be somewhere in the lobby or out front. Um, would love to just be able to, again, say hi to you before you get out of here, okay? Sound good? Well, uh, man, I, again, I've been out for six weeks on a sabbatical, and, and I just want to say a word uh, to, the, to the church, um, to all of our volunteers, uh, to all those of you who lead in different capacities, whether that be in our kids and preschool ministry, whether that be holding doors, welcoming folks into this, whether that be part of our setup team, who gets here early and leaves here late, uh, will that be part of our hospitality, that be our first responders, will that be serving in student ministry on Wednesday nights, whatever you did and whatever you do, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for the way that you've led, for the way that you've served, for the way that you've continued to give faithfully, um, the way that you continue to love our family during this time away. It has been felt, and, uh, and I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. So can we just thank all the volunteers in our church, man? Thank you, guys. During our, uh, during our run-through this morning, I was just telling the team, you know, when we started this church almost four years ago, um, we, you know, we started with nearly 50 people and, and, and very much in those days, it felt like you brought a newborn baby home, right? Like you, re- there's a realization that hits you that like, if I don't feed this child, uh, they aren't going to make it <laughs> like it's on you, you know? And so in some ways a new church feels that way. Uh, but man, this thing is not about Matt. This is bigger than Matt and praise God that it is that this church will go on well past Matt. And so, um, man, I'm just so thankful for all of you. And, uh, I, mean, I can't tell you, I love you enough. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to say something publicly. Um, I know kind of, we got into it a minute, but I want to thank man, Charity and Mary and Caleb for how they've led this church, uh, while I've been away. Uh, can y'all give them a hand as staff here, man? Incredible. Um, and, uh, and, and I'll say to Caleb, I know he's carried a lot of weight. He's, he's, he's filled the pulpit so well. He's fed you guys well. He's followed up with you guys throughout the weeks. Um, and he's been running VBS and camp and all kinds of things. And uh, I can't say it enough. You guys probably get tired of hearing it, but I'm thankful for Caleb. He is faithful. He loves Jesus. If you have a student and they're not in his ministry, you're missing out um, because he's somebody like I want my daughter to grow up to, to love Christ the way he loves Christ and love the church the way he loves the church. So, man, thank, let's thank Caleb again, man. Just can't say it enough. Man. So, uh, man, it's been hard to bottle up, man, all that the Lord did while we uh, were away. All the, Really, to put into words this morning, I told Tiff, like, I, I don't even know if I'm going to, you know, remember like, how to do this thing. Uh, you know, all that, all that God did while we were away, if you missed uh, kind of the situation um, the week before we, we left on sabbatical, the boys that we were attempting to adopt for over a year um, transitioned out of our home uh, and into the home of a, a wonderful foster family in the same city as their biological parents. Um, and God willing, they'll be transitioning full time back with those uh, with their father um, in the coming months. And so, um, you know, it, it's hard to to say to articulate. In my life, I've never felt um, pain the way that we felt pain that week. Um, coming back home to two empty beds and empty toy buckets. In in reality, we were the ones in that moment that was empty. Um, so I can't I can't imagine coming back and trying to fill this pulpit and and uh, and pretend like. I had something to give you, the, you know, those days after. Um, but, man, in the Lord's goodness and his timing, I didn't go on sabbatical, just so you know, because I felt like I was burnt out. No, I, like, 
this thing, or this church, you, you, you put so much life in ourselves, like purpose for our life is found in what we get to do here in serving you guys. So the occasion wasn't because Matt's like, you know, man, he's getting tired. That, that wasn't it at all. Like I'm like an energizer bunny, if you know me, like, uh, you know, um, and, uh, but man, what I didn't know, I didn't know a year ago when we started planning the sabbatical that we'd even have kids in our house. I didn't know that, um, that, man, we would have two boys in our house and that this adoption would be, um, you know, would be falling through. I didn't know that God would transition them out of our house days before this sabbatical. Um, but praise be to God, he knew, right? He knew. And, uh, and, and so this sabbatical met us in a time when we needed it more than we knew we did. And, uh, and so, man, for that, I, I'm just, I'm so, so thankful to God. It was a gift from him, for our family. Uh, and it was a gift from you. It, it truly was. So many of you reached out. I mean, you loved our family. You watched our crazy dog. Some of y'all did that. Uh, some of y'all were like sending us like lunch money and date money, just like loving on us, uh, praying for us, um, creating space for us, man. And it, it was it was awesome. We're so so we're so thankful. So we've had a ch- time to heal, uh, time to rest. It's it's not ever like I don't think we're there yet. Like there's moments where it still hits us, right? Um, but more time, more pavement between the events. Uh, God's going to do uh, a healing work in our lives. We're confident in that, man. So we've healed. We've been able to rest. We've been able to focus on him, focus on each other, build some incredible memories together, really reset for the season ahead. And, and honestly, this is the key word I want you to hear this morning, to, to, to revive, to, to be revived. And uh, <laughs> I kind of hit the ground running after my sabbatical. I had five weeks where we were resting and all that, and then uh, I had already been scheduled uh, and, and, and uh, it, scheduled and planning, and they had already, you know, ran promotional stuff for a camp, uh, to do a camp in Cedarville, Ohio, at Cedarville University with 900 students for a week. And so last week, I came to, I got to Cedarville, and I've preached, this will be my, my ninth message of this week, um, and uh, man, we saw God do some incredible things, but man, we hit the ground running, and, and we were, um, I did a camp under the banner, Revival Generation, that was the theme, Revival Generation, and so for months and months and months, six months at least, I've been praying for students to be revived. I've been, pre, I've been uh, God gave me a text for these students to be revived, but what I didn't know was the passage I was bringing to a bunch of students, I've been praying over a bunch of students to be the very one that God needed to use in my life, and it's the one I want to I wanna bring to us this morning. Um, and so if you have a Bible with you, I want to go to Psalm 85. Psalm 85. And I pray and I, I trust that Lord will use it in your life like he did my own. So when you have that, Psalm 85, 1 through 6, I want to ask you to stand with me as we, as we read God's word together. It says this, just six verses. It says, Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? And here's the key text. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grab a seat. The passage that, um, that I just read to you is actually not about, although the Lord used it in this way, it's actually not about God raising the spirits of the brokenhearted. Again, although it certainly does that. It's, it, it's not primarily even about how God brings comfort in the middle of chaos in our lives. Although, I'll tell you, God's been faithful to do just that with this passage in my family and in my, and in my life. This passage is a prayer what it is. It's a cry from God's people. It's a prayer lifted to God to do what we believe only God can do, to revive and restore. To revive and restore. Specifically, this is a, this is a communal cry. This is a congregational 
cry to God to do something for Israel, again, that they believed that he was the source of, that to, to revive them in the middle of a dark and difficult time. Now, if you know anything about Israel, throughout Scripture, their story is immense. Man, it, it is complicated. It was full of promise and potholes <laughs> along the way. It was, it was full of, of seasons of of unbelievable faithfulness and fidelity to God, and then there were seasons of spiritual freefall. This was, this was true of Israel. And in the middle of like the going and the coming of the tide of their spiritual lives, you have this beautiful prayer of revival for the people of God. And I think that's why, as I reflect on it, why I, I feel so strongly about it, why I gravitated to it, because uh, our life is much the same. Your life. Is, is much the same. Sometimes, guys, listen, things are great. Like, I, and listen, I promise you, I don't want the tears to fall anymore. Like, I want us to, to be joyful because the Lord has done a great work in our lives. He has been faithful to us. Sometimes in our lives, man, things are great. Um, there's times when we're in our lives and in our walks with the Lord, we feel like we're, we're, we're floating in some ways, right? Like we're experiencing victory over sin. Like in our, in the seas of our lives, all is calm and the Lord is blessing and he feels close. But there are other seasons. There are other seasons, other times where the lostness and brokenness of the world around us, the scripture says that all creation groans eagerly for restoration, for renewal that God's going to bring. And there's times where that reality is so present, right? It brings, uh, it brings difficulty and devastation into our lives. There's times where emptiness and the futility of everything around us becomes so clear and it begins to take a toll on you personally and spiritually. This is where my family's been. But the point is, we're not so different and dif- you're not so different and distant from Israel, really. Which makes this prayer in the book of Psalms, our prayer. This, this belongs to us this morning. If things are going great in your life, and I trust for most of you they are, praise God. If they're going great in your life, then you're in a season of blessing and triumph. Then the prayer for you is not to be shelved. The prayer is to God, give me more. Like pour out more of yourself for me to, to revive whatever he must in you so that you, you're taken deeper, that you have more dependency on the, the Lord, that, you are, uh, that he would give you more and more faithfulness in your walk with him. And listen to me, who can't use a little bit of that this morning? Like that, that, that prayer of revival for God to give you more love for Jesus than for whatever's competing this morning. That, that, that prayer of revival to trust in Jesus more in the face of certain circumstances that are coming. Some of you don't even see it yet. Revival in, the, in, in, in our hope in Jesus. Man, we look out at the news. We watch the, the things that are unfolding in our country. And we can lose hope as parents. Seeing our kids walk into school systems and say, are they safe? Is this right? Did I mess up? Man, revival that we would hope in Christ. That he holds them. They're his. He loves them more than you could ever. He knew them. He authored them. He sustains them. So revive our hope. Revive our love. Revive our trust in you. So the application of the psalm is a great prayer for revival personally, but contextually, which I want to come back to, what does the word mean? Well, contextually, it's a prayer for revival nationally. It's what it is. Israel crying out to God to do a work in the people of God, to revive the nation that needs revival. And again, the events of last night make this passage unbelievably timely. I'm upstairs in my bonus room, like, like praying over t- this morning, and, and, I'm, and I'm watching what's happened. And I'm like, Lord, revive us again, oh God. Do, do something that only you can. Our world today is broken, fractured, and divided. It, 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 I'm mean, sorry, broken, fractured, divided, and confused. Man, it's confused about identity. It's confused about sexuality. It's confused about gender. It's confused about the value of life. It's confused about what is marriage. Uh, we're confused about where true joy and purpose and hope are found. It's confused. Man, this became so apparent to us on our trip. We went out west on a little uh, camping trip. Um, we, we, me and Tiffany, 
flew into Glacier, like outside of Glacier National Park. We rented a camper van. I should have put the picture up online, um, uh, up on the screen. We rented a camper van, and we, we stayed in that thing for seven nights, and we're still married, believe it or not. It's amazing. God revived us, I'm telling you. Um, and we made our, our way. We camped through the national parks in the nor- north. We, we, uh, we drove all the way. I drove <laughs> all the way through Montana. There's no we and it's me. Uh, all the way through Montana. Like I told Tiff, you're driving everywhere. They're going to think you're a chauffeur around here from now on. Now, you have like 900 miles in the hole. Uh, anyway, so we, we got to Yellowstone. We get to Yellowstone. We camped around. We got to go see Old Faithful. And uh, I remember when we got there, if you, anybody been to Yellowstone seen Old Faithful? Okay. Um, it's awesome. Uh, don't know that it's like crazy. But uh, anyway, it's the, it, was, it was a good time. So anyway, so we get there and it's raining and lightning and people are wrapped around this boardwalk waiting for super hot water to blow out of a hole in the ground. I mean, like literally, like, I mean, they're standing in the rain and lightning and there's hundreds and hundreds, maybe a thousand or more people standing around this thing, waiting for this thing to go off every 90 minutes. And I remember we got, we, we went up, we found this little seat up front, we sat down on the boardwalk, we're sitting there watching, and these scientists, these geologists or whatever were behind us, and I remember me and Tim were like, we thought this conversation would go a whole different way. These guys are like, I just can't believe people would come to the park, and they would see this incredible event, and they would go back, and, and I was like, yes, yes, they're going to be like, and they wouldn't praise Jesus for what they saw, and he's like, and they wouldn't just give a great appreciation for geology. And I'm like, bro, like, geology like it's beautiful but like what it should do in us is create a great love for God not geology right our world is confused man our world's so confused that's just a perfect illustration about how broken twisted just just in left field we are right now listen we used to sit on a foundation of Christian principles but today that is eroded onto shifting sand that's where we sit today we need revival because if something doesn't change our churches are going to continue to wither in effectiveness. Our society is going to continue to spiral into more and more perverse theology and ideology. Marriages are going to continue to suffer. Generations of kids coming after them are going to spend their life separated from the church and the Lord because they've been raised in it. In places all over the world, people are going to perish without the news of the gospel. That's what's at stake. So all that to say, man, I'm trying to build a case. We need revival, church. We need revival personally, and we need revival corporately. And this is, that makes this passage not just a good psalm for Matt on sabbatical. This makes us a good passage for you. This makes us a good passage for our, our nation in the face of an election a few short months. We don't need more carefully crafted comments on Facebook. We need revival. This might be unpopular, but, but the answer for the brokenness in our world isn't in who sits in the Oval Office. It's who sits on the throne of heaven, that we need revival. But depending on your religious tradition, you have different ideas about what I'm saying when I say revival. And so what I want to do in the short time I've got is, and just so you know, I, I got all kind of like, you know, stock of, of minutes. So y'all hold on, okay? Um, in the time I've got, I want to talk about what is revival. I just want to answer three questions. What is it? What is it? Who's it for? And what's it change? Okay, so quickly, what is revival? Well, verse 6 tells us the Puritans used to have this practice that they would take a single passage in Scripture and they would wring it out for every drop it had. They would write hundreds of pages just thinking on the depth and the weight and the intricacies and the beauty of what this passage says about God. Now, I'm not going to do that this morning, but we are going to spend the rest of our time in one verse. So verse 6 says this, Will you not revive us again that we might rejoice in you? First thing I want you to know about what is revival is that it begins and ends with God. The text says, will you, God, not revive us again that we might rejoice in you? It begins and ends with the Lord. He's the one in focus, not us. This is a prayer for God to bring revival. And this is important because typically when we think about revival, we talk about it like we're the point. It's about how many people can get under a tent, how, many, how, how long we stand to sing. And, and it's not about what God did. So we need to flip the focus this morning that it begins and ends with God. When we pray for it, what we're asking God to do isn't to revive a relationship so our marriage gets better. 
It's not that, uh, we, you know, for, for God to give us a raise or for God to bring revival to our nation to serve our political interests. That, that's not what that is. Revival is about God. It's from the Lord for the Lord. It's from the Lord. It's for the Lord. We can't manufacture it. We can't manipulate it. I told the students I was, uh, I was teaching to this, this past week, like revival's not camp. It's not an event. You can't put it on a calendar. Old revivalists in American history created this notion that you could schedule it. And through man-made means, you can bend God's arm to bring it. It's not what you see in the scripture. Will you not revive? It's a prayer. It's begging God to bring what only he can. Will you not revive us again, O oh Lord? Revival is not night two of camp when all the middle school girls come up crying to the front of the stage. That's not revival. And revival is not night four of camp when all the high school relationships break up. Like, that's not revival. Revival is not VBS. Revival is not camp. Whatever. Revival is where the people of God, it's a gift of God, where the people of God receive from God what was missing with God. I want to say that one more time. Revival is a gift from God where the people of God receive from God what was missing with God. That's what revival is. It's where God gives us something that's missing, passion for the things of God. This may be where some of you are right now, lacking zeal for God, lacking a, a love for his word. It's where God gives you a hatred for sin in your life and renews an energy and, and an excitement about what he's doing in your life, and specifically about the gospel going to people who've not heard it. So that's what it is. It, it, it is it is. Receiving from God what was missing with God. I love how John Piper put it. He said, revivals when many Christians are lifted out of spiritual indifference and worldliness into a conviction of sin, into more desire for the things of God in his word, a boldness in our witness, a purity in our life, lots of conversations and conversions about Jesus, joyful worship, renewed commitment to missions, and I love this last piece, don't miss this, revival is where you walk away and you know that God was with us, that God moved here. Oh, come on, man. Does anybody in here want a little bit of that? Like, that, man, you left here, or you left your time with the Lord, and you said, Matt didn't preach a good sermon, God showed up. Right? Like, like it wasn't the songs we sang. It wasn't the message that was preached. It was that God met with us and did something in our midst. Like, that's what I want. I, I want more passion for this next season of ministry. Like, I want more zeal. I, I want more excitement about what God is doing. I want more boldness in my life. I want to hate sin more. I want my marriage to flourish. I want my kids to love Jesus. I want to see more and more people in this church and in this community coming to know Christ, being baptized in obedience to, to the word, like, and going into the schools, going into their neighborhoods, telling everybody that's moving into this city from all over the world, right, that Christ is Lord. And that's what I want. That's what I want to see, man. In summary, let me say this, revival, this sermon's not over. Revival is where we get an upward focus on Jesus, an inward brokenness over sin, and a renewed passion for the Lord, and an outward concern for what, what God's doing among the nations. So it's, in, it's upward, inward, and outward. That's what revival is. But who's it for? Who's it for? The text says, will you, oh God, not revive us? Again, so who's it for? Us. It's for God's people. Revival movements seem to, throughout history, have confused this notion. That really, when you think about revivals, it was about people coming down front. It's about people charging the altar, you know, at the end of a, you know, the sixth verse of come as you are, right? Like that, that's kind of what we think about revival. It's about lost people coming to know Jesus. And it certainly is the effect of true revival that great awakening happens, but that's not ultimately what revival's about. Revival's about shaking up God's people. That's what it's ultimately about. This past week, I had a, a guy, one of the leaders of, of one of these churches that was there, he came up to me and he said, well, 
He didn't come up to me. I saw him in the hallway, and he wouldn't make eye contact with me. It was after, uh, after I had shared a little bit of this, and he said, he said uh, I made a statement. I can't remember exactly how I said it, but I, I, I told them, I said, if you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord, I'm not talking to you right now. I'll get to you, but I'm not talking to you right now. And he said, for 30 minutes, you cut out, or 15 minutes, you cut out half the group of my kids. And, and I said, well, how many kids did you have? He said, three. And I was like, oh, okay. And, uh, and, and so he, he wouldn't look at me in the eyes. And, uh, and I said, man, are you, are you okay? And he was like, I just disagree with what you said. He said, I think revival, you know, I'm all about evangelism. He said, I'm all about evangelism. Like, I, I think you just preach to lost people and, and overlook, you know, if the, if the church hears it, great. I'm like, well, that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. I said, I said, bro, let me just say this to you. Um, for one, camp's a long time, so I'm getting to your kids. I said, but revival is not for, you can't revive the dead. I said, what, what lost people need isn't revival. They need repentance. That they need redemption. They need a relationship with Jesus. That's what they need. And what I'm hoping is that the other half of your students who are here and are apathetic to Christ will come to know Jesus and will tell your kids in a way that you can't that Jesus is worth following. Like that, that's what we need. That's who this is for. Revival's for the church to wake up. It doesn't mean that non-believers aren't beneficiaries of revival. In fact, the natural reflex of God's people who love Christ and come alive to the things of the word of, of, of the Lord and his word is to tell somebody about it, right? Look at Acts 2. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and all came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who were believed were together and, all had, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds as, all who, uh, as any had need. And day by day they attended the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And what happened? And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So the, the results of this excitement and focus on Jesus is evangelism. It is repentance. It is that people would come to know Jesus. It is awakening. But ultimately, what we're talking about is for shaking up those of God's people who are weary and weak this morning. I'm talking to one of you here. It's for all who were once on fire. And now, if you're honest, you've dwindled to a flicker. It's for those who were once devouring their Bible, but now can't find it. It's for those who were once so close to the heart of God, but now feel closer, honestly, to the world around you. It's for those who are quick to confession, but now you are covered in compromise. Revival's for you. Let me say this to you. Look at me. Revival's for me. Won't you revive us again, O oh Lord? I resonate with the prayer of Paul in Ephesians, when I think about revival, he says this to the church. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant, he's talking to a believing church, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through, the, through his spirit in your inner being. You can't have the spirit in your inner being if you don't know Jesus Christ, right? So we're talking about believers. He said that he might that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend. With, hold on. With all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be, here it is, filled with the fullness of God. This is what we're praying for, man. That God would give us his fullness. Some of you feel like your cup's half dry. Don't settle for that. Ask God to revive us again, oh Lord. Give us a fullness of you. He's not withholding it. He's more ready to revive us than we are to ask for it. Right? It's, God, would you bring this in my life? Will you give me a passion for your word? Would you help me have a concern for lost people in my neighborhood rather than just driving by them like they don't exist? God, would you fill us up to overflow? And that's what we need, the fullness of God. That's what we're asking for. But what's the point? What's it change? It's my last point. What's it change? Will you not revive us again? 
that your people may rejoice in you. Did you see it? That your people may, what's, what's, the, what's the effect? What's the why behind revival? Again, it's not our political or personal interest. It's that our joy will be found in Christ. That's what it is. So what's it change? It changes everything about your life. When God revives us, he shakes us up to see that the thing we've been placing our joy in is empty and dead. And that our joy would be rightly placed in the Lord. That it be found in God. That he would be the thing that we wake up thinking about and we go to sleep on our mind. That he would be the thing that we're most passionate about. Listen to me. That he would be your supreme dream. That he would be your supreme desire. That he would be the thing that you sacrifice for. Lord knows we sacrifice for all kinds of things that we love. You want to know what people will do? Whatever they want to do. (laughs) People will do what they want to do in life. I found that. They'll come to your church if it's 30 minutes away if they want to be there. People will stay in bed if that's what they want to do. People will line up around a hole in the ground. Every 90 minutes to watch water spit out of a hole. I'm serious. They'll do it. Like clockwork. Why? Because they want to. Revival is God changed my want to. It's God give me, give me a love for you. Set my joy on you. Set it there. Let me talk about you. Let me give to you. Let me sacrifice for you. Let me tell my kids about you. In short, revival changes everything. It changes everything. So maybe you're here this morning, you're hearing this message. You're reading this prayer from this psalm. And maybe, if I'm honest, like everything in you wants to echo these words. Like you feel weary, weak. You feel tired. You feel apathetic. You feel indifferent to God. These words are for you, do they? These words will meet you like they met me. Maybe you're here and at one point you were on fire for the Lord, but you've lost your way. You were hearing from God. You spent time with God. Something changed. Maybe you walked closely with the Lord, but you are, maybe you are walking closely with the Lord, but you look out at our nation and you're broken and you want to cry these words out for God to send revival. This isn't for one of us. Listen to me. This is for all of us. So won't you, won't you revive us again, O oh Lord? I want to ask uh, Michael to come, and I want to close with a story. I was doing some reading um, during, a lot of reading during this sabbatical, and the Lord brought me to a story of a guy I had never heard about named Evan Roberts. And the uh, story is... Um, this guy was 11 years old when uh, he was pulled out of school. He was born in uh, Wells, which is on the, the northwestern side of Great Britain. And, um, and he was this Welsh kid. He's a coal miner's son. Um, and he uh, went to school, um, kind of, you know, grow, was raised in a church, uh, raised in a family that loved Jesus, um, gave his life to the Lord early on. And at age 11, he was pulled out of his school and taken to work at the coal mine and his job at 11 years old was to open the gate for all the miners who would go down the the mine shaft and they they said that about his life as they would go in he'd be reading scripture to them and praying for these guys he was so passionate about the lord and he went off to college and it said that when he went off to college he went to seminary and when he came back he felt tired he felt empty He felt apathetic. He felt like his fire for the Lord wasn't there anymore. And so he came back and started begging God to restore what he remembered when he was a kid. Uh, His landlady that he rented from even kicked him out of his apartment because she thought he was crazy because he spent all his time praying out loud. She said, this man's mad. So she she evicted him. Well, the, the, the kid started this prayer group and started begging, calling out for God to to not only revive him, but revive his nation, to revive Wells. And it says that today, 
During this time, it led to, this thing grew, this prayer movement grew. God brought revival to Wells. It's called the Welsh Revivals. It was very famous. Over 100,000 people came to know Christ. They said in 10 years after this revival, 80% of them were still plugged into church. They said today, if you go to Wells and you go to a soccer match and you're in there, they'll all start singing uniformly, many times out loud, hymns to God. A nation was literally changed because an 11-year-old boy, God got a hold of his heart, and and later in his life, he started begging God to change not only his own heart, but that nation, the nation he belonged to. And, uh, man, the Lord took me to one of his prayers, and it just wrecked me. The uh, thing he would cry out to God was really three words. I'm going to put them on the screen behind us. You have those? Right here. Lord, bend me. He would just cry out like, Lord, bend me, God. Bend me, God. Bend my heart. Bend my affections. Bend my desires to fit yours, God. However you want to use me to serve your glory among the nations, however you want to use me to make Christ known in wells, bend me, God. If it means that my dreams got to bend, bend me, God. If it means that my family's got to bend, bend me, God. If it means that my, that, that my budget's got to bend, bend me, God. If it means that you wanted to do something, this has been my prayer. God, you've met me with this. You think about everything that our families walked through. God did this. He brought this to me. He said, Matt, this is how I wanted to bend you. I wanted to bend you and maybe even break you so that I could do something so much greater than you could ever imagine. I'm doing more. So I start praying, Lord, would you bend me? Would you keep bending me? If this means that my family has to be hurt, that two boys were loved and they were, they were brought back to their dad and you raised them in church and they come to know you and they become missionaries that go to the ends of the earth, then God bend me, right? Like for you, like what does God want to do in your life? What if you started, what if we started as a church praying this prayer? Lord, bend me. And if it breaks me, but you get glory and you bring revival, then do it. Bend me, God. Bend me. Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. God, I ask that you would bend us, God. And Lord, I also ask if there's someone in this room tonight, God, that or this morning, Father, that, that, that doesn't know you, Lord, they can never pray that prayer in a way of revival, Father. I pray that what bends in their lives is that their knees bend before you to your Lordship and faith of Christ. God, that you would save them. God, ultimately, this, this, this psalm is a prayer, God. We cry out, we ask, God, you would revive us, Father. In the summer, it's so easy for us to hit coast and to just to get complacent in our relationship with you and to grow apathetic and honestly to limp into the fall in this captive time that you have us, Lord. But God, would you revive that, Father? Would you dump lighter fluid on our souls today? Oh, would you let us run into the fall, run back into our schools? Some of these kids are going to step back into new schools, new campuses, new homerooms. Father, dump lighter fluid on them, God. Help them to pray this prayer. Lord, bend me this year. This year ain't about me. Bend me, God, that your name in, in Christ would be made known. There's some marriages that have been self-serving in this room. God, I pray that the prayer of that marriage would be bend us, God. Bend us to make your name great. Bend us to see how we can serve you. Bend us to see how our, our lives need to change, how our finances need to change, how, how we can start serving this community for the things of God. Not about building life point, about building your kingdom, God, about making Jesus known. Lord, would you bend us, God? We love you.